Good morning, and welcome this morning. Now, we're glad to be back after, well, some of us went out to drop Jeremiah off at college. I just realized this morning that I took pictures of the campus and my wife hasn't seen them yet. We'll have to remember to get around. The campus is sprawling. Uh, how many acres would you say? Maybe six, eight? The church property is one acre total. So uh, they have an academic building, an administrative building, a men's dorm, a ladies' dorm that has the cafeteria in the basement, and a chapel and library building. So there's four buildings on campus, and the parking lot's right in the middle. So as Jeremiah was packing, Jen says, you know, do you need an umbrella? He goes, just to walk between buildings? No. <laughs> he does have an umbrella with him. He'll probably never get it out, though. At college? I went to Houghton, and that's a pretty rainy spot, and I think that's where I actually got an umbrella, and I used it a couple of times. But uh, great little campus, and... Uh, Things seem to be very well done there. Their cafeteria food, very, very simple and basic. It's like camp food at, at a Servant's Heart Camp. In fact, the same girl served us the first night we were there that served us at camp last time we were there. Well, one of them, not that one. Uh, what's her name? Rebecca? Yeah. And uh, I said, wow, you're serving food here too. She goes, I haven't poisoned anyone yet. And we, my brother said something to me because he was there. And I said, well, I don't know where we're eating. And he goes, oh, he runs off. He comes back with a meal ticket. And you can get 10 dinners for $30. Like, uh, I can't even get like a hamburger at McDonald's for $3. And I get a full meal complete with whatever dessert they have. They have one meal and one dessert, and then there's multiple drink options, I think. But good, healthy food, and, and uh, the kids want to tell me it's homemade food, but you can't make homemade food in a cafeteria. It wasn't made at home. So it's, it's cafeteria made, but good stuff, not the just dump and, and call it a meal type thing. So. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Jeremiah as he gets started off in school and and uh, looks like a, a fun and encouraging and biblically strengthening place to be. I did feel better after the, I think it was the second night's mess service. Brother John, the president's son, was leading music and he ran over my niece who was playing piano. And I feel better about running over pianists now from time to time. Because they did Saved, Saved. And, you know, he raises his arms and all of a sudden we're singing, I found a friend who is all to me. And the first two measures, the pianist both like tripped over themselves. Two pianists. Neither one of them kept up the first two measures. And after that, they did. And they did the umpapas at that speed. So they're up there. And uh, I thought they were going to be out of breath at the end. I talked to Kaylin afterwards, and she said, yeah, I didn't know if there was time for the umpapas. And I said, and you didn't have time to figure out if you could stop doing them, did you? And she goes, no, not really. And uh, I talked to Brother John afterwards, and he goes, I don't normally sing that song. <laughs> and I said, well, it was a wonderful speed to sing it at from time to time. It's good to change up the tempo. And... Uh, he is a very enthusiastic young man. And uh, so you have to sing at, at a good tempo on those. So it was exciting to be out there. The uh, talk to the president. And he goes, so if you're ever back in the area, let me know. We'll, you know. we'll give you a place to stay. And I was like, oh, that would have been better than getting a Verbo off campus. We could have just stayed there, I suppose. And, and, uh, and when they found out I had brake problems that I was going to be fixing, they're like, well, where are you going to be fixing it? Out here in the parking lot? Because we know people that have tools and we can get you whatever you need. Like, well, aside from my floor jack, I have everything I would need for a brake job in my car because I travel with tools. But like, well, if you want to do it here, just let us know and we'll get you tools and ramps and jacks. And 
And there's this guy that if he if you need a tool, he has it. I'm like, oh, okay. So I didn't know you lived out there, but it's it's all good. So very friendly. I was expecting the well, don't change don't change your brakes in our parking lot. That and since I didn't go back to the Verbo the first afternoon, I showed up for revival services in blue jeans, a uh, black jeans, not blue jeans. There's a difference. Running sneakers and uh, a shirt like Levi's, only it looks more like an old man shirt, not like Levi's. Mine, for some reason, the, the plaid shirts I have look like old man shirts, and the ones you guys are wearing look great, and I can't find ones that look like that. And my wife tells me they're old man shirts. So I'm wearing one of those, and no one looked sideways at me. No one raised an eyebrow. And, and I said something to the president afterwards, and he goes, well, I have my standard for how I dress, but I'm not going to tell anyone else how to dress. They need to listen to what God wants them to wear. So I'm like, everyone in the student body is wearing suit coats. And there's Pastor Hadley wearing sneakers and, and a casual shirt. And I said, I didn't feel out of place at all. And he goes, well, that's not my job. Like, good. We're at a good place here. So we thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, look forward to being able to stop by to see Maya sometime, maybe. But if you're ever out that way, their hospitality is is uh, is top notch. So, uh, as far as announcements, we'll have a snack the end of uh, September. That's coming up. As far as prayer items, um, I think everyone was here for Sunday school, so you heard all the prayer items there. Uh, but Dory's vehicle uh, could definitely use some prayer, so you can keep that on the road and running. I didn't write down when you said the. Dates were for her hearings. When are those? She has hearings on September 12th and December 6th. 6th, 6th. So be praying for those that uh, God works and moves through those. And of course, I also mentioned my dad's uh, cancer in his bladder, and they're waiting to hear what the options are there. Uh, for Mike, the window of the guy getting cleared to return to work so that he can get off the Sunday duty just got slammed closed. So pray for uh, wisdom and options there as well, I guess. And, and uh, some other needs are listed there on our prayer sheet. Um, Austin, could you uh, lead us off this morning in a word of prayer? Start with hymn number 45, Surely Goodness and Mercy. When you finally stand together, 45. A pilgrim was I and a wandering. In the cold night of sin I did roll. When Jesus the kind shepherd found me, and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. He restoreth my soul when I'm weary. step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness 
goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. When I walk through the dark, lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there, and safely His great hand will lead me to the mansions He's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day. shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days, all the days of my life, all the days, all the days of my life. Thank you. you. May be seated. 183 beneath the cross of Jesus. 183. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me, and from my smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess, the wonders of redeeming love and my Four hundred and thirty-nine, cleanse me. Four thirty-eight. Oh, would you like to switch it? Thirty-eight. Yeah. Oh, thirty-eight. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. The piano's new. Okay, four thirty-eight. Search me, O oh God. Cleanse me from 
from every sin and set me free. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Oh, fill thy word and make me pure again. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord, take my life and make it holy life. Fill my poor heart with thy great love Okay, we stand for the scripture today out of Hebrews chapter 3, and we will do the reference to the beginning of it. Hebrews 3, 7 through 13. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3, 7 through 13. Thank you, may you see. Let's look to the Lord in word of prayer as we take up our offering this morning. Father, we are thankful for your word and the challenge and encouragement it gives us. And Lord, we do pray as we've read the encouragement from the writer of Hebrews to not harden our hearts, that you would help us to, rather than harden our hearts, to soften our hearts towards your word to soften our hearts towards your spirit, that when your spirit uh, moves in our hearts, when we read something in your word and your spirit, your word speaks to us, that we would respond, that we would not wait, that we would not delay, but that we would build into our, our hearts and our, our lives a pattern of obedience and, and of quick response to you. We do pray as we take up our offering this morning that we would honor and glorify you with our gifts and with our attitude as we give, and we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
find out the first verse. Name that offertory. Uh huh. Played out of a hymn book, but she might not know that it's in our favorites folder. That's one of the favorites in there. So I think that's one of Mr. Fredrickson's favorites. I think that's how that one got snuck in there, was uh, by his suggestion. And I don't think I knew the song before it got put into our favorites. I think that was my introduction to that hymn. I don't know how I missed it for so many years. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 11 this morning. We were going to be in chapters 11 and 12 because it's the 10th plague and why not just cover the whole 10th plague. Uh, but as I considered it, the problem is the 10th plague, the killing of the firstborn, is mixed together with the celebration of Passover. And if I was trying to do the 10th plague justice and the teaching of the Passover, it was not going to work very well in a typical uh, service period. So my options were to like run up past noon and uh, throw all that out the window to try to cover it all or break it up. So since we're not in a hurry to get through the book of Exodus, there's still plenty of Bible there. We, it doesn't matter how long it takes to get through Exodus. We're just going to take chapter 11 this morning uh, because there is uh, plenty in chapter 11 for us to consider this morning. Our title tonight, this morning is Respond to God's Word Today. And that's in our scripture reading. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And we have that, that all through scripture. We have that example that, that God encourages us to respond as he works in our hearts. One of the, the joys of, of uh, sending kids off to a servant's heart camp over the years has been the first week the phone is going to ring and it's going to be a kid that says, the preaching this week has gotten to me and I need to get some things right. And uh, some of that, it's like, okay, need to, we mentally prepare ourselves before the phone call comes now that it's happened more than one year. The first year we weren't mentally prepared for that. And uh, it is wonderful to see God at work in a life and to see a tender heart in response to God's word. Now, what Satan wants to tell us is you don't want to respond because you don't know what response you will get to making things right. You don't know what response you will get to, to, to clearing the air or to trying to, to settle things up. And Satan will tell us all the bad things that could happen because of our obedience. Well, in Exodus chapter 11, we find the bad things that happen when we don't listen and we harden our hearts because eventually God has enough. Now for salvation, we know that there is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. That for salvation, the end of the line comes with our death. Up until we are dead, we have the opportunity to choose God in salvation, which is a wonderful promise to hold on to. And some people have said, I will respond to God at the end of my life because I don't want to ruin my whole life with following God. I'll just choose him at the end and bypass to the good part, which is very short-sighted and not a clear understanding of what it means to follow God to begin with. Then it's also very short-sighted in the other part. That's like saying, I don't want to replace a timing belt in my interference engine too soon. I'll replace it right before it's about to break, which is a wonderful thing if you can calculate when it's about to break. It's an okay thing to say, I will choose God at the end of my life if you know when the end of your life will be. So, well, I got plenty more years left. Oh, none of us know the day or the time. So for salvation, there's a time when God says, enough. But for those of us that are saved, there's also a time that God says, enough, when he brings correction into our lives. And there are times when we can probably look back to our, in our lives and figure out that God has said, enough, and God stepped in with some correction that we could not sidestep. Uh, I like to look back at times sometimes when when I thought I had my finances in order 
and I had things financially under control and God stepped in and made sure that I understood that he was still in control of my finances. And he doesn't do it in a vindictive way. But as we read in scripture, God says, you say you've got all of this and I will blow on it. And I've seen God blow on it and it all disappear. And then I've seen God meet my needs without it. I said, okay, God, I've lesson learned until the next time. Lesson learned until the next time. And there comes a time when God has brought correction into our lives and we haven't responded that he ratchets up the correction. The encouragement is respond to God today because the ratcheting up of correction is not something that any of us should desire or look forward to. So whether for, for salvation or for fixing an area of disobedience and sin in our life, today is the day we don't know when God will say enough. Exodus chapter 11 verse 1 tells us, The Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. We know there are ten plagues in Egypt. Moses was told, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and, and Pharaoh won't listen. God did not tell Moses how many times this would happen, but here he says, this is it. One more plague. What God says is, time is up. Pharaoh's had his chance to respond, and his time is up. And we see the severity that's going to be coming here. What's interesting about when God says time is up, is that Pharaoh still thinks he's in charge. Because chapter 10, verse 27, says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's hearts. And, and we can get hung up on that. There are times it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and there's times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And you say, well, what's the difference? The difference is, I believe God gave man a free will, and he does not override that. When the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart, this is not God taking Pharaoh in a direction that he did not want to go. This is God using Pharaoh's hardness of heart to display his glory. And so it goes back and forth with the Lord hardened his heart and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, who's doing the hardening? Pharaoh has a hard heart and God is using it to his glory. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, to Moses, get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more. For in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, thou hast spoken well, I will see thy face again no more. Now, that means Moses does not leave Pharaoh before chapter 11 takes place and Fa Moses tells Pharaoh one last thing, what God has said. But if you look at that verse 28, that Pharaoh said, get thee from me. Pharaoh thought he was in control. Pharaoh tells Moses, you're not going to see me again. If you come see me again, that will be the day that you die. Pharaoh tells Moses, I've had enough. We're not doing this anymore. And in the hardness of his heart, he thought he was in charge and that he had had enough. What we find out in chapter 11, verse 1, is that God was still in control and that God had enough. In Pharaoh's hardness of heart, he gave no heed to the fact that God was at work doing something. That's the warning for us. In the hardness of our hearts, we will look and say, God is not doing anything. We will say, God is not at work in this circumstance, in this situation. We will say, I'm in control and I'm not pleased with how things are going. That's what Pharaoh did. Oh, we can get that way in life. We can easily get that way in life when things don't go the way we expect them to. When whether it's a small thing or a big thing, things don't go the way we expected. For a student, it might be that a matter of who your classmates are or what teacher you get. Now, I guess Colleen hasn't met her teacher yet, so that's a small thing. You go, oh, I got the wrong teacher. Well, no, God's at work in that. For homeschoolers, it might be. 
I, I heard them on NPR interviewing people that started homeschooling during the pandemic and kids that were homeschooled during the pandemic. I noticed that no matter how hard they tried, they really only got one kid that called in and said, I wish my parents would send me back to school. The rest of them were like, this is great. But on the radio, they said, call us if you've left traditional schooling to homeschool. And I thought, well, there's a nice, interesting twist on things. Um, traditional schooling would be homeschooling and public schools are relatively modern but it's uh, like all right whatever and they were going back back and forth with it and and uh thought it was interesting you know well parents pulled kids out of school because they didn't like this or they didn't like this and, and parents put kids back in school because now this was available and and all of these and we have these inconveniences and these kids well you know i i miss my friends and i i, I saw one of the public school kids heading back to Panama this week on Saturday, Friday. I was at Walmart and I'm walking by a car and the car doors open and I hear, Mr. Hadley! They were getting ready to leave, but they saw me and they had to greet me. And uh, I was like, so you ready to get back to school? He goes, yeah, I haven't seen anyone over the summer. How big of a town do we live in? He saw none of his classmates over. He goes, well, I saw one kid once. Like... Well, this is weird. Yeah, you're ready for school. They'll start back up. But kids come up with their inconveniences that this is wrong. Well, us as adults come up with our inconveniences too of this is wrong. And, and we fail to see God at work. And when we say we've had enough, sometimes we've got to understand that it's God that our disobedience is pushing to the edge. Pharaoh did that. And you say, well, Pharaoh wasn't saved. Yes, but as believers, we can do the same things to God. And Pharaoh was right. He said, you shall see my face no more for in the day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. That's true. Moses didn't see Pharaoh's face again. And uh, Moses died before he saw Pharaoh's face. So that's okay. He was right. Pharaoh was right. He would see Moses no more. But Pharaoh was wrong. It wasn't he that had had enough and he that was in charge. And he was going to kick Moses out and stop these plagues from happening. God was going to stop these plagues from happening with the finality of plague number 10. It was God who had had enough. And when God has enough, he accomplishes his plan at any cost. It's going to happen. It's going to be accomplished. Now, there are things that when, when we know something is going to get accomplished, us standing in the way is going to get us run over. There are other things that we can kind of work our way around. Uh, I guess there's a 70-year-old lady in Dunkirk. Anyone see her in the paper this week? She lives right next to the Wells Ice Cream Plant. The Wells Ice Cream Plant is going to expand. Well, they have plans to expand. They announced her plans to expand and to hire lots of extra workers. Only they did it before they secured all the properties that they need to buy to expand their facility. And this woman that lives right next to the Wells Ice Cream Plant said... I rented for years and years and 28 years ago I finally had enough money to buy a house and I bought this house and I'm 70 years old I can't move I don't want to move I'm not going to move now that might work out well for her and she said it's not about the money they've offered me plenty of money and then I don't know if Facebook saw that I had looked at this article but it showed me the the picture of the house of a woman that was offered a million dollars for her house for them to put in a mall where she lived and she didn't sell so they built the mall around her house very convenient shopping for her they should have given her a couple of doors so she could have entered different wings of the mall those mall developers were going to accomplish their plan at any cost I don't know what Wells is going to do are they going to modify their plan to go around her house are they <laughs> Are they going to find another way to do it? Are they going to just decide not to expand their... I don't know. Is this woman going to decide? Is she just seeing to see, trying to see if she can get more money out of them? Uh, be interesting to see. Wells is not God. They will not accomplish their plan at any cost. They cannot do anything they want. They may succeed in this. We never know. But when God has enough, he accomplishes his plan 
at any cost. If it's an unbeliever standing in the way, judgment is coming. If it's a believer standing in the way, correction is coming, and, and often in a way that we would not want to look forward to. We would not say that that is the way we desire to go. The expression, people say, don't pray for patience, God will give it to you. Well, how about this? If you're going to pray for patience, practice patience. Because then you won't get run over when God gives you patience. At least you'll get run over less when God gives you patience. Because, you know, when you pray for patience, you have to have an opportunity to exercise patience to do it. And if the opportunity to exercise patience was easy, you wouldn't really need patience. So if you're going to pray for patience, just expect God to give you things that are going to try your patience. Sometimes we pray for patience expecting life to go easily. Like, what, know you not that the trial of your faith worketh patience. You pray for patience, the trial of your faith is coming. Well, God is going to accomplish his plan at any cost. For Pharaoh, those results were going to be severe. Pharaoh did not let the people go. The results would be severe for Pharaoh standing in his way. I already mentioned Hebrews 9.27. For uh, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this a judgment. God has enough at some point in the life of every person. When they die, there is no more opportunity to choose salvation. But we also read in our scripture reading that God has enough in the lives of believers as well. Because in, there in Hebrews chapter 3 in our scripture reading, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Take heed that you listen to the Spirit of God, you respond to the Word of God, and you do what God calls you to do. Because when we don't, we're asking for it. God will get it out of us because he has began a good work in us and he's going to accomplish it. I go to work on a car and I love watching mechanics online working on cars because they have the same struggles I have sometimes. And they'll say, we're going to have to escalate matters. I love when they escalate matters and they grab the five pound mini sledge and they start beating on it. Because like, I've been there, I've done that. I particularly like when they grab the sawzall. Because I've been told that you should not use a sawzall to work on a car. And when I see a, a YouTube mechanic use a sawzall, I feel justified in using a sawzall. Because I don't have torches. And I love when they get out the torch because they're like, I don't care what you think, you're coming out. Well, God is more powerful than those mechanics. And when God is doing a work in his life, he is going to accomplish it whether we cooperate or not. There comes a time when time is up. Verses 2 and 3, we find out that whether then, then that be a threat against us, it's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that those who follow God will be blessed. We can, we can get the hammer of God. We can get run over by God. Or we can seek his blessing. Verse 2 says, Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold. Now, that's always an interesting verse because God tells them to borrow and then they're going to leave the country. And that sounds an awful lot like theft. But I think we're misunderstanding the borrowing here because I don't think this is just borrowing as in, hey, I'll give this back to you next week. And oops, I'm out of the country, so I don't have to. So we don't need to get hung up on that. But I do want to get hung up on the fact that Moses tells the people this. Do you think all two million of the people of the Israelites got extremely wealthy out of gold and silver from their neighbors? If God's instructions to us this morning were to go and borrow of your neighbors... Go ask your neighbors for stuff. Would all of us think that was a good idea? Personalities are different, right? Some people would go, all right, because <laughs> my neighbor's got some really cool stuff and I'm going to go ask for it. And others are going to go, I've got to like, knock on someone's door. One of the pastors preaching at 
at the revival services at, at Indiana Baptist College was from East Texas, small town. And I think he said, what, 2,000 people in town? And uh, granted, that's bigger than Nio, but the county was smaller than the whole of the city of Jamestown. So it was a small county. He goes, interesting thing, when you go to knock on someone's door, not only do you already know who it is, when you go, when you go to witness to someone, you already know who it is, and you probably know their dog's name too. <laughs> and you know when you can find them at home because it's a small town. And uh, I can imagine that not all of the Israelites did what God commanded but those who followed God's command were blessed. Because verse 3 says, And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Why should the Egyptians give their stuff to this strange people, these slaves living in the land of Goshen, that had been serving the people of Egypt for almost 400 years? Why should they give them their precious jewelry? Because God told them to ask, and God gave them favor. It's a wonderful thing when God gives favor. When God asks us to do something and it doesn't make sense to us and we can't see how it's going to work out and God gives us favor and we say, I don't know how God did that because it didn't make sense that that would work out and it did. There are missionary stories where missionaries have done this. I can't imagine that the government will allow this and they've gone to the government and they go, sure, great. We'd love for you to be able to get the gospel out easier. Well, how did that happen? God prompted a believer and God gave favor where it was needed. God blesses when we follow him. So we might look and say, well, you know, you're dealing with the stick. Respond to God's word today because otherwise God's going to get you. Well, yeah, that's the stick side of it. And some of us are very thick skulled that we need the stick approach sometimes. Others will respond well to the carrot. Well, the carrot is that those who follow God will be blessed. Not only does obedience mean that correction is not needed, but those who follow God will always be blessed. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt. Very great in the land of Egypt. He was a prince who just spent 40 years out on the backside of the desert, has come back in and has wrought miracles that has caused misery across the land of Egypt. This man was very great in the land of Egypt. I imagine. Uh, notorious, probably. And in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people, that God blessed. And there are blessings for doing things God's way. We don't always believe that. We sometimes think that we've got a better corner on things or that we can do things better. But doing, God's, doing things God's way results in blessings because God has built in rewards to obedience. When you do things the right way, right things happen. Uh, when you go to follow instructions, uh, one of the mechanics I, I, I watch online he likes to call them destructions, and he says they're not always necessary. He's a man, and that's how we think. Uh, I saw the latest video was putting back on a rearview mirror, which is a very precise thing. You've got to go through the steps properly, clean the glass, clean the metal properly, hold the button. I've done it a couple of times, and uh, he made it look like it was harder than I remember it being, so I'm not sure. Maybe I didn't do it right, but it, it always... It, he always called them the destructions, but he goes, these destructions you need to follow. There's an activator, there's a glue, and you need to go through the proper steps because there's a lot of weight holding on this, and they're very smooth things, and it will make it stick together. Do you know all of God's instructions are not destructions? All of God's instructions are for our benefit. And there are built-in rewards for obedience. For Israel, these rewards were gold and silver and precious stones. For us, we might look and go, well, where's my gold and silver and precious stones when I obey God? God's rewards for us are not always in the financial realms. They're normally bigger rewards than that. Finances in the Bible, money is a small blessing, and God's got bigger blessings for us. And there are rewards for doing things God's way. 
There are rewards when we treat the family the way God wants us to treat the family. There are blessings for that. There are, re there are rewards for being faithful to what God calls us to. There are rewards for living a life of purity and keeping things the way God designed in his word. And science bears that out time and time again when they do studies. There are rewards for getting a, taking a day's rest out of a week. There are rewards for doing things God's way. He has built-in rewards to the way that we are created. And God rewards. God gave favor and the people borrowed. And it didn't make sense for the people of Egypt to give rewards to the people of Israel. Why would they bless these slaves that were being led by Moses who caused great misery in the land of Egypt? Because God told them to, they obeyed, and God gave the people favor in their eyes. Those who follow God will be blessed, but judgment will fall severely. Verse 4, Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the land, midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man nor beast, that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the land of e between the Egyptians and Israel. Judgment will fall severely. Pharaoh was warned. He's been warned plague after plague after plague. You need to let the people go to worship. God was going to bring this. God was going to be glorified. And Moses says, one more. The firstborn are going to die. Now, Pharaoh still has a free will. Pharaoh could say, Moses, it is enough. We have suffered enough. We have lost enough. I do not want to lose my firstborn son. Tell me what I need to do. You would think that any rational person that has already witnessed nine plagues with the destructive nature that they have witnessed, being told that the firstborn was going to die in all the land of Egypt, including his firstborn son, that that might move him, challenge him, cause him to repent, cause him to say, what do I need to do to make this not happen? But that's not what happened. Because Pharaoh doesn't listen. He was warned it was coming. He was warned how severe it would be. The lesson for us is when we harden our hearts, we can get to a point where we no longer believe that correction is going to happen to us. When we no longer believe that God is going to try to fix what is wrong with us, that he will let us go our own way and do our own thing, despite what he has said. And when we harden our hearts, we can get to believe that the way Pharaoh believed it. It will come. But we deny it. Our denial of it doesn't make it hold off any longer. Doesn't make it stop coming. God's will will be accomplished. And again, carrot and stick. The carrot side... Verse 7, but against the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. I like that promise. I've had a fear of dogs since I was bit by a dog. Not all dogs make me afraid. But if a dog surprises me and it's got a bark, I can lose my mind when a dog barks. If I know it's there, not a problem at all. I can mentally prepare myself. But if a dog surprises me, it takes me right back to when I was in seventh grade and I got bit by a dog. My face was tore open. And in fact, yesterday or this week, I looked at Google Maps and was tracing the road that my dad ran after blowing out the motor mount in the car to get me to the hospital. He ran home to get another vehicle while my mom flagged down a passing truck and made them take us to the hospital. I don't think they had an option. It's still very vivid in my mind and, and dog scare. A dog won't wag his tongue shall not move his tongue against you. Like, yes. Safety and security, even if I don't know that dog is there. Against man nor beast that you may know. For blessing, Israel was not going to be impacted by this. We're going to find out Passover and the, the, the sprinkling of the blood and all of that. But Israel 
Verse 8, all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow themselves down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. I wish that was more specific, but I think Moses was angry. I'm sure Pharaoh was angry. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. God's will will be accomplished for blessing and for judgment. His plan, his decree will happen exactly as he says. Obedience, it's going to yield blessing. Not listening to God in disobedience will bring his hand of correction. Well, how much correction is needed? Well, it depends on how we respond. We need to respond to his word today. Ignoring God's word is done to our own hurt. God says, Pharaoh shall not hearken, verse 9, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. God will be glorified in our lives. Whether through us obeying and, and, and have, letting him work in our lives, or whether through our disobedience and God stepping in and correcting, God will be glorified in our lives. That my wonders may be multiplied. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. And as I said, we could tend to read that and say, see, Pharaoh didn't have a choice. God hardened his heart. No, Pharaoh always had a choice, but he had a hard heart. He practiced not responding to God's word. He said, yes, I'll respond. I'll let you go. And then it let, lessened, it lightened, and he said, no, forget it. Well, that's like when we hear God's word and we say, oh, I'm going to do something about that. And then we go about our week and we say, you know what? I think it's past. Maybe, maybe that wasn't the spirit of God. Maybe that wasn't the word of God at work in my heart. Maybe it was something I had for lunch. In which case, eat something better for lunch so you don't get confused between indigestion and God's work in your heart. But sometimes we think, if I just let it go, it'll go away. Ignoring God's word is done to our own hurt. Now, as much as we may laugh at a check engine light in a car, it's on in my van. I got to get that turned off before the inspection. I think just pulling the light bulb doesn't work because they plug it in and see. But ignoring that is to our own hurt. Ah, well, I know why it's on. Well, I will check why it's on. My guess is catalyst efficiency. We're going to get that taken care of. But I need to check to see if there's anything else there. That check engine light says there's something wrong under the hood of your car. You need to check in on what is wrong with it and possibly, probably repair it. And we could say, well, you know what? Those come on a lot. I'm just going to leave that on. I know what that one's for. It's just loose gas cap. I'm not going to check. Well, then we find out that, well, no, it was something much more severe than that. and Your engine blew up. There's a warning and we ignore it to our own hurt. Now you might say, well, my check engine light's been on for four years. If you have, I hope you look in from time to time and check the codes and make sure there's not new ones that are horrible. We don't want to ever ignore that warning in our car, but we certainly don't want to ignore the warning from God's word because God doesn't speak because of emission rules that may not matter. God doesn't speak because something is slightly out of balance and it turned on our check engine light. God speaks always for our benefit and our blessing. And when we don't respond to his word, we do it to our own hurt. We're going to close this morning with hymn number 338. As believers, the first time we responded to God was there at Calvary. And that's the type of heart we need to have in responding to God all the time. Hymn number 338. At Calvary, when you found us stand together, 338. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on God. was free, hard and there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary, by God's word at last my 
my sin I learned Then I trembled at the law I spurned Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to me so for liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and great was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burden so for liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that God salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend. At Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free, but and there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. At Calvary, Father, we are thankful when we think about salvation. That when we came to the cross, we recognize that we were sinners in need of your grace, that we were sinners in need of your mercy, that we were sinners in need of your gift of salvation, sinners in need of the love of Christ shared with us by going to the cross to die for our sins. And Lord, as we may have come in fear, knowing the sinfulness of our own hearts, what we found at the cross was mercy and grace and love beyond what we could imagine. And sometimes when we look at responding to your word, we tend to picture that things are going to get rougher or things are going to be harder or that responding to your word hurts. But Lord, every time we do it, what we find is that mercy and grace and love meet us there. We pray, Father, that you'd help us to respond to your word. I don't know if it's as we contemplated this this morning that you were at work in a heart, that you brought something to mind that, that someone needed to deal with. And the temptation might be to think that, yes, I need to deal with that, but I'll deal with that later. And, and Lord, that you would impress on that heart that they need to deal with it today, that they might confess it before you, even as we're in prayer now, that they might go and, and, and talk to someone and, and, and say, can you help me? Can you keep me accountable? Can you help me to overcome this area of sin in my life? Respond to your word today, that they might find that mercy and that grace. And maybe if there was nothing specific today, that, Lord, as we go through our week this week, and we look into your word, or we may hear a message from you on the radio, we may be humming or singing along with a hymn and be challenged or encouraged by it, or we may just be reading in your word and be challenged, that we would not put it off, but that we would respond to your word in a way that honors and glorifies you. We'll thank and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.